Novels by Barbara Kingsolver and Daniel Mason explore historical periods and societal divisions. Kingsolver's Unsheltered delves into post-Trump America, while Mason's novel tackles polarizations in 19th century Vineland, New Jersey. Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. All right, I'm sorry to be a nerd that like quotes William Faulkner, but while listening to today's interviews, I did have that one line of his in my head. Uh, that's maybe overplayed, but still, you know, it's the one that goes, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Because both books today tell stories that take place throughout these long stretches of time. In a bit, we'll hear from Daniel Mason, who's got this wildly ambitious novel that Kirk is called Multitudinous and Magical in its review. But first, an interview from a couple years ago with Barbara Kingsolver. Before her Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, Demon Copperhead, she wrote a book called Unsheltered, and it uses the Civil War to look at post-Trump America. But she tells former NPR host Lulu Garcia Navarro that the book isn't about leaders. It's instead about people's willingness to be led. Barbara Kingsolver is the best-selling author of The Poisonwood Bible and The Lacuna. After six years, she has a new novel which tackles the divisions in America that have been around for a long time and remain unhealed. The book is called Unsheltered, and she joins us now from WEHC in Emory, Virginia. It is my great pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks. Uh, This book is done in alternating chapters uh, set in two different time periods, one just after the Civil War in 1871 and the other in 2016 America. Uh, Tell me why those periods um, and what do you think they have in common? I wanted to write about how people behave when when their world seems to be coming apart. Um, and why do we keep trying old solutions to new problems when it looks like they're not working anymore? And I also realized it's hard to understand a crisis when you're in the middle of it. I chose this moment in the 19th century right after the end of the Civil War when the country was absolutely as polarized as it is now, on very much the same geographic lines and sort of cultural lines. Talking about race, talking about the economy struggling and... Urban versus rural, industrial versus agrarian. We really were two countries and people could not imagine how to put them back together. And into this walks Charles Darwin with two new books he released into the world that caused people to have to question their place in the universe. And it seemed to me that it would be interesting to take a set of characters who were living in that time and a set of characters in this time and put them both in the same place. And the place where they are living is Vineland, New Jersey. Um, and, And it has this fascinating real history, which you uncovered while researching this book. It was a place that was originally created as a sort of utopia. Absolutely a utopia. It was founded by Charles Landis in the 1860s as a utopian community, but utopia in the terms that he and people in Victorian times could imagine, which still contained a lot of class, gender, and racial bias. So it was utopia, except that the workers were doing all the work and the rich <laughs> people were having this lovely lecture series in the life of the mind. So, And so many of the characters are real people. They are. Charles Landis, the petty dictator of this town. But most interesting to me of all is a woman named Mary Treat, who was a lady scientist, as they called them in those days, a naturalist who corresponded with Darwin and who uh, worked with him through uh, correspondence on various experiments. And she was really a strong advocate of Darwinian worldview. So in that era, you pit the sort of scientists like Mary Treat and and other characters and the journalists of that era against the demagogues in the form of the man who founded the town, Charles Landis. Right. And then in this modern era, the main character is also a journalist. And the family has fallen on hard times. They're dealing with failing health care and poverty and unemployment. And they're also debating the 2016 election. And they're feeling panic, too. The certainties of life are being swept away, but differently. Yeah, they also are 
experiencing this disorientation. This is a family of people who really mostly followed all the rules. The adults, anyway, have followed all the rules. Willa, the protagonist, feels like she did everything right. She got her college degree. She worked hard. She's been a journalist for most of her career. And in her mid-50s, her magazine folded. She was a great editor, but there were no jobs for people like her. Mm. Likewise, her husband is an academic, and their family has followed his quest for tenure from city to town. Finally, he got tenure, and then his college folded. So all of the problems this family has are problems that are, um, <laughs> you know, sort of come from the... The real life that we see. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say sort of my standard, you know, meeting with friends, you know, afternoon with friends, the things we talk about are all of these things. People are losing every kind of shelter, even people who have not felt that they were particularly vulnerable a decade ago are finding that the rules have changed and that all of these various kinds of shelter that we've all counted on are crumbling. So now what? You compare these two eras quite pointedly with two of the of the leaders of, of that and this time, the President Donald Trump, although you don't name him. and I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> and, and Charles Landis, the sort of demagogue of, of the town. Mm -hmm. It's really not about leaders so much as people's willingness to be led. I'm interested as a novelist in, you know, the human psyche. That's our, our paint box. We look at behavior and look at the different things people do in response to crisis. You have Mary Treat saying, I suppose it is in our nature when men fear the loss of what they know, they will follow any tyrant who promises to restore the old order. Yeah, I did write that. <laughs> so this is a very political novel in as much as it grapples with the big themes of the moment, climate change, science, journalism. What is the role of art in this time? I think the role of art in any time is to look past the door frame and the and the window frame into what's just outside our daily experience to try to broaden people's vision a little bit in any way that the novelist uh, feels capable of doing that and to create empathy for the theoretical stranger. And um, I wanted to look past blue states, red states, put all these people in one place, one household, and see what makes all of them tick. Because you live in Appalachia, right? And so you have a particularly unique perspective on this. I do. I live in a very rural place, southwestern Virginia. I also work in a profession that means most of my colleagues are in urban places, mostly in New York. So I move between red state and blue state, between rural and urban, between these two cultures that are so divided that they've really stopped talking to each other. They only talk about each other. And I'm the bat, you know, that's neither mammal nor bird. I have to fly between these cultures and see what I could render for the reader in terms of interest and in terms of sympathy. I feel there's a bigger question looming over the book in comparing these two times separated by 150 years uh, in which many of the same issues are being debated. Is this novel saying that there really is no progress and we always end up in the same place? Well, I don't think it's saying that exactly. I do think it's saying people are people. Um, hmm. There are things about us that will always be true. One of them is that when we feel there's a scarcity, we get real grabby. Um, <laughs> we want to get ours. I think it's deeply embedded in our nature, in our DNA, to be suspicious of the other, of strangers, of people who seem different from us. These are all inclinations. That's not to say it's how we should be or even that it's how we always are. But I also want to remind you that I write literature. So I really work in the um, domain of sentences and images and character and personality. So above everything, I want this to be really fun to read. 
It's a great read. Thank you. <laughs> Barbara Kingsolver's new book is Unsheltered. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. All right, this next interview is a great listen for anyone interested in the craft of writing. Daniel Mason's novel, North Woods, jumps around between like forms and characters and voices. There's all these things going on, and I think a lot of writers might find that messy or intimidating even. But he told NPR Scott Simon that hopping around like that afforded him some indulgences that he wouldn't have been able to get away with otherwise. <laughs> like, for instance, when he writes about beetle sex. Daniel Mason's new novel, North Woods, opens in the 17th century with a young man and a woman running from their Puritan village into the forest. The book tells the story of civilization and generations through a patch of land in the woods of what's now western Massachusetts. Let's ask the novelist to read what happens when the couple reach that spot with a pond to clearing and seedlings raising their heads through ash. Here, he said... They stripped their last rags, swam, and slept. It was all so clear, so pure. From his little bag, he withdrew a pouch containing seeds of squash and corn and fragments of potato. At the brook, he found a wide, flat stone, pried it from the earth, and carried it back into the clearing, where he laid it gently in the soil. Here. What follows that here? Life, death, despair, and desire, an orchard grows, ghosts prowl, poisons lurk. Forbidden love blooms and apple seeds sprout from the ribcage of a murdered English scout. There's also romance among all species in Northwoods. The novelist Daniel Mason joins us now. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I want to begin by asking you about one of my favorite characters, Charles Osgood, which I may not have to tell you is an honored name in the radio profession. Mm. Hmm. Your Charles Osgood is enthralled by apples, isn't he? Right. So Charles Osgood was a major um, in the British Army, and he's stabbed by a bayonet, which has recently been used to cut an apple. So perhaps that's the reason why he becomes bewitched with apples and obsessed with the idea of raising his own orchard. And so he leaves this illustrious career and decides to head up into the mountains to found his own orchard. And the tree that he finds is the tree that we've seen 60, 70 years earlier, growing up from a seed, which is from an apple in the belly of this English soldier that you mentioned. Much of the book then follows in some ways not only the history of the people who live in the house, but also their interaction with this apple tree that sits around for a long time. And there's like a lot of drama without giving away too much of the plot that occurs around the apple tree itself. What do the apples represent to him, do you think? What do you call it? Pomomania, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's an invented word, pomomania. Maybe it will become a, a true uh, recognized yeah. psychiatric condition one day. So literally a, a mania for fruit. You know, I think for him, he's somebody who has um, spent his life um, in the service of human goals and for the first time has turned towards the land. Something that I found in researching Northwoods is when wanders around in the woods, one encounters old apple trees everywhere. And in places that seem like untouched forest, and you realize there must have been someone here at some time who planted this and cared for this and brought it up. And so for him, I think it also connects him to a kind of history as well. Yeah. You also tell these stories through uh, letters and poems and journals, case notes of a psychiatrist at one point. How do you communicate in so many different voices? Not just people, but personalities who are, who are in different eras. So one of the fun parts I think about writing this book was that there's a lot that I want to say, but there are limits. And in this case, using these older voices not only was fun, it's like finding some instrument that you've never seen before and, and, and trying out like an old rusty trombone you find in the attic somewhere, seeing what it sounds like, seeing what kind of music it makes. But also there's this opportunity to express thoughts that perhaps my contemporary English don't enable me. And so I think, for example, one of the characters who I love is a, a mid-19th century painter, a kind of Hudson Valley school-like painter who paints the natural world. And is very, very attentive to what he's seeing as part of his job. And so using his voice enabled a kind of um, indulgence, really almost kind of overriding, but in a real sort of indulgence and in description, which I think I really couldn't have gotten away with if I had just used the voice that I regularly write in. Later in the book, there's some sensational killings. There's a true crime story, again, that allows a sort of tone that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to touch. 
I have to ask you about a scene in particular, and I note that more than one review has centered on this too. Midway through the book, you have the most vivid, detailed, you can tell where I'm going. I know where you're going, yes. Luxurious and erotic scene, and it's about beetles. <laughs> right. Can we talk about this on public radio? Uh, <laughs> undoubtedly, we have to issue a warning. Next few minutes, we will be talking about beetle procreation. Please go ahead, Mr. Mason. Okay. All right. Well, not just beetle procreation. I mean, romance. You describe it as true romance. Yeah. You know, even though I've, I love writing about nature, I had previously really mostly written about nature as a kind of setting. And mm -hmm. this time around, I, th I thought I want to write about it as a kind of protagonist. What would it be like to treat it like I treat my human characters? And of course, all the good stuff that makes up the stories that we want to hear about human characters, all the drama, the sex, the violence, the treason are ones that we can find in the natural world as well. So what happens in the book is that, I think many people know, New England forests have been dramatically changed by a series of diseases that have come either yeah. in by wind, in the case of chestnut trees, or in the case of the American elm, which used to line in most streets of most northeastern cities across the United States, uh, by a little beetle that, that carries the pathogen in when it burrows in to set up its nest and eventually to mate. And so this is really a moment where if we focus our attention on the beetle, what we're seeing is not a story of destruction, which of course it is for the tree and of course for the people who live around the tree, but this is the great romantic moment of the beetle's life and what would happen if we turn our lens onto that experience. I mean, I'm reluctant to ask you what kind of research went into this. <laughs> yes. Well, so this is one of those moments where truth is better than fiction. As I was reading around about, let's just call it the erotic life of insects, uh, I came across this wonderful academic piece that very vividly described the mating patterns of the skeleton beetle, um, and I believe it's subtitled, A Romp in the Sack. Oh, Ooh, S-A-C. Yes, right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. A very funny title for an academic piece. All of the lives in here that pass through this forest and pass through this house and inhabit this patch of earth at different times, separated by years and even centuries, do their lives, do our lives feed off one another? I certainly feel that that's the case. And I think one of the fun parts of writing Northwoods was thinking about how so much of the world around me right now um, is filled with meaning that I actually am not aware of. All the houses that I've lived in, all the places that I walked are places that have these tremendous histories, tremendous amounts of drama, all of which has been lost for time. And yet there are ways of sort of peeling back that history, either through reading or literally through archaeology or anyone who has an old house who's um, had a moment to see what lies behind the wallpaper knows that there's an incredible depth to these stories. And so that gives me a lot of solace, not only connection to people around me at a particular period of time, but the sense of a connection to the people and plants and, and animals who went before me. Daniel Mason, his new novel, North Woods. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having us. Well.